Welcome to the Silverstone Raven RVZ03. Hello there, Evie here. Welcome to the review of the Silverstone RVZ03 Raven. Raven RVZ03, I'm not entirely sure which way it is round. Probably should have checked. Anyway, we've got quite a lot to go through in this video. If you want to skip to any part in particular, so overview, build of certain components, so installation, that sort of stuff, uh, all the testing or the B-roll or whatever, go to the video description or go to the pinned comment in the comments, uh, which will have all the different timestamps in there, and you can just click on one and jump to that part. And remember, when you're watching the video, if you just don't particularly fancy the bit you're looking at you can skip to the next part uh, on in the video description or in the timestamp or um, comment anyway so what we've got coming up is an overview so looking at the case with nothing inside it particularly or nothing inside it at all and checking out all the different individual components then we'll have the build uh, I have actually gone through the customer service uh, with regards to getting a replacement component so, uh, for this so you'll be, be able to gain my experience in that there are actually a couple of things for the uh, for the potential owner of this case uh, if they come across any troubles that I did they would want to check that part out in particular and yeah then we've got the completing final end of the build then we have the testing thermal testing a bit of b-roll and then a wrap-up where I go through pros cons missed opportunities I've got a fair amount probably about I don't know well it's that many things about 30 things to go through or something at the end just to uh, round off everything so in case you've sort of you know fallen asleep halfway through the video which is potential because this is a very long one uh, then you can catch up there so anyway thanks for checking this video out I will catch you in a second to start off the unboxing and the overview the Silverstone RVZ03 is a mini ITX tower style case available in white and black colours, the latter of which we have here for review. Quickly cutting through, the packaging starts off with a nicely styled cardboard box, but we're not here for the box, so opening it up reveals further packaging consisting of the standard polystyrene bookends and a fabric cover which is a nice improvement over the common plastic bag. But we're not here for that either, we're here for the RVZ03. So let's kick off with a quick external overview of the case. Starting at the front, from the top we have this really bold, almost sword tip style protrusion with a brushed aluminium effect plastic centre. Not actually the downgrade from real brushed aluminium you'd think, this stuff practically looks the same, only it's much more difficult to damage. Further down we see a split light diffusing strip that merges into a central section that forms the diffuser for the LED lighting behind. This style is maintained all the way down to the base, where the style is symmetrically identical to the top. However, here we have the front I.O., which has two standard USB 3.0 ports, separate microphone and headphone jacks, the reset and power button, and of course the drive LED indicator. Back to the top, the brushed plastic section wraps up and over to create a clean band straight to the back, which also adds to the cooling strategy as an exhaust overflow area. This design also applies to the base, but that's where the symmetry stops with this case, which is not always a bad thing. To one of the sides of this case, this side being fixed and part of the chassis, is the ventilation intake for the power supply unit up top, and the graphics card further down, which is where two of the three 120mm fan positions are. If you didn't know, this case can be mounted on either of its sides, the top and the base, which would then make the previous top the base. It can get confusing to explain, so when I say side, up and down, it can all be changed based on the case's orientation, so you should take it with a pinch of salt. Anyway, I quite like the pattern of the fan grills by the graphics card section. It's a bit of extra detail over the standard fan grill, but looking back to the grill of the power supply unit, which is comparably very standard, they just look a little mismatched. Heading to the back of the case, the motherboard position can be found up top, with an overflow ventilation section adjacent, and below those we find the PCI Express slot covers, and another ventilation overflow section, and the power supply unit pass-through connection is right at the bottom. As for the side panel that is removable, here we find the final 120mm fan position. Again notice the side of the grill is the same as that of the other 120mm fan positions, which makes the power supply unit grill look even more out of place. These are just minor details of course, but to some people it's worth pointing out. Anyway, back to the review. Tipping the case on its side means we can take the side panel off and check out the interior. There's a 120mm fan attached to the inside of this panel, so while it's not hooked up to a component, the wire could get caught somewhere like the power supply unit bracket in my case. Before we get into the interior, the side panel itself is really solid with very little flex, and the slot and hook retention mechanism is very smooth, which can be tricky to get right, or at least a lot of other cases make it look that way. 
As for the fans, there are two 120mm wide, 15mm thick, 1500rpm fans that come with the case. They're not the quietest of fans, I have experienced some noticeable motor noise, but we'll see how they fare up in terms of performance during thermal testing later. The lower section of the case has a really interesting bracket that holds the drives and supports the graphics card, and can be taken out after removing these six screws. Underneath that bracket is the position for the graphics card and two 120mm fans. You can see one of the two included fans underneath the bunch of front I.O. cables, and to the left is the position for the power supply unit which has to be mounted to a bracket first. To remove the bracket requires access to the outside of the case. There's no special secret fixings connecting the bracket to the chassis, instead there are four screws that need removing to free the power supply unit bracket. Inside the power supply unit bracket is where the accessories box can be found, and before we move on, let's check that out first. We'll get onto the user manual in a second, but just check out how much stuff was inside the box. The thing was absolutely packed. So quickly running through it all, we have the PCI Express riser extender, we'll be paying particular attention to that later. Then we have all the screws, consisting of 16 through fan radiator screws in two different thread sizes, 2 screws for the graphics card support brackets, 10 screws for the motherboard and power supply unit, and 16 2.5 inch drive screws. Here we have four adhesive backed pads for horizontal mounting, and if it's your thing you also get an adhesive backed aluminium badge. These are the two brackets and adhesive backed rubber pads that form the graphics card support, and you also get a fan splitter cable to link the two included fans to one fan header. It's even a nice one with a fabric sheath. Then there's a pile of cables and a box, which are all for the lighting of the front panel, and any other LED accessories you'd like to get. I'll be explaining exactly how to set all of these up later, for those of you with or without an RGB compatible motherboard header. If you want to vertically stand your system like you've seen on the box, the manual and everywhere else, you can use these feet which don't require any adhesive. This is my preference since it reduces the footprint of the case on your desk, but I'll be thermal testing vertical and horizontal orientations later to find out how each perform. And finally we have these three optional 120mm magnetic fan filters. Just before we get back to the case, let's quickly cover the user manual. From a first touch and a closer look, you can tell it's made from a high quality linen paper, but is the contents as high quality as the paper? For the most part, yes. There's a great breakdown of all the components you should have and what they should be used for, and there are some good descriptions for the most part with good illustrations. But some parts such as the lighting setup are missing illustrations where there should be, and there's a lack of thorough explanation like the lighting control box connection outputs and inputs, and the case's maximum official water cooling compatibility. They include 16 screws for radiators but don't explain compatibility past their 120mm AIO. And just as a final point, when the first topic of your contents page starts with introduction and specification, and after copying the user manual into a Word document to make finding all these spelling mistakes easier, presents you with there are too many grammatical errors to continue displaying them, you know there are some problems. Joking aside, there were multiple languages that contributed to the error showing up, but there are a good handful that I've just picked up casually reading the paper version. I know this is a small point, but for a product that's selling thousands of times from a relatively well-respected company, these simple little things just make it feel very slightly less professional than I know this product is. In this day and age, manufacture origin is no longer an excuse. Anyway, back to the case. The top of the case is purely for ventilation, the right half being more focused for the power supply unit exhaust, but the left side could probably take an 80mm fan if you really wanted it to. The front of the chassis has the LED control wire to the left, and the power supply unit extender cable across the bottom which loops around to the back. So the centre is a support, divider and storage drive bracket, as well as a cable management assist to a certain degree. It's really very well designed. And all the way to the right is that large bundle of I.O. cables and wires, and of course the fan we saw earlier. On a closer inspection of the front I.O. PCBs, the top section of USB and audio jacks looks alright, but the LED, power and reset wires just look a little messily attached to the front of the case. As for the base of the case, again like the top there is potential to add some 80mm fans down here, but nothing is officially supported along this panel. And finally, to the rear of the case are the overflow sections covered earlier, as well as the slot for the graphics card mounting bracket and rear I.O. shield. Speaking of which, let's take a quick look at the graphics card panel while it's unoccupied. To the rear is a really interesting 2.5 inch drive mounting position which has more to it than initially meets the eye in a good way. 
But up front on this side is the main position for the graphics card, which has more to it than meets the eye in a sort of bad way. And the reverse side of this panel has storage for another two 2.5 inch drives, but we'll check all of this out during the build later. Speaking of which, let's get back to that power supply unit bracket. The RVZ03 can take up to a 150mm ATX power supply unit, but that adds a load of problems into the mix, so we're going to go with an SFX power supply unit that's only 100mm long, the Corsair SF600. To mount an SFX power supply unit to the power supply unit bracket, you'll need an adapter bracket, such as the Silverstone PP08. Now just getting back to the issues with a full ATX 150mm power supply unit compared to an SFX power supply unit in this case and many other ITX cases. For starters, since this case is so tight, an ATX power supply unit will take up a much larger amount of space that's really important for cable management. Speaking of which, the cables on a typical ATX power supply unit are about twice as long as those on a typical SFX power supply unit. So not only will you have a larger power supply unit, you'll also have more cables to have to put somewhere. Of course this depends on the system you're installing. Other great ways to cut down the size of the system to help with cable management are to go for a smaller graphics card, smaller drives such as M.2 SATAs or M SATA form factors, or less drives in total if that's an option. As you can see, the 100mm long SF600 fits perfectly into this power supply unit bracket, but more than that, it provides a decent sized slot for some cables to be stored right above. Something I really wanted to show was the relationship between the ventilation elements in this case. Taking a look through the side panel shows us that the side panel will be pushing air right down onto the CPU cooler, and from there the air will be exhausted mainly out of the back and the top. Bear in mind that the graphics card will be blocked off for the most part by the large bracket, so we'll be getting a similar treatment to the CPU, where the fan or fans directly next to it will be providing cool air and the positive pressure will be forcing the air out of the back and through the base of the case. There doesn't seem to be a viable neutral airflow scenario with this case, since reversing any of the fans will create opposing forces to the fans on the graphics card or the CPU cooler. And back to the build, you'll want to connect the power supply unit pass-through at this stage since there won't be any room once it's fixed. You'll also want to turn the power supply unit on at this point since it's very difficult to hit the switch once it's fixed in place. As for the motherboard, the IO shield is the IO shield, not much to say there, but the motherboard was a squeeze to fit in, so if you're struggling, you may want to install the power supply unit afterwards, and it may be helpful to someone to know that the standoffs are fixed, so if you destroy a thread when installing the screws, it's probably shot, but to avoid that, I'd recommend counter screwing before screwing, as painful as that sounds. Onto the drives, occupying the two main slots of the graphics card brackets are two 250GB SSDs, technically one 240 and one 250. They are mounted upside down which is intentional since you can access the screws to replace the drives without uninstalling the graphics card. There's modding potential here if you keep an open mind. Now here's something I find really cool and this will be made more apparent later. This drive position is on the other side of the panel from the other drives but is accessible from the opposing side. It's quite a simple concept in hindsight but it's a really interesting solution to adding more drive slots to this panel. As for the finale of this panel, the graphics card installation. This starts off simply enough with a standard removal of the PCI Express slot covers, only of course they're attached to this panel separate of the chassis. Once they're out of the way, we can reach for the graphics card and slot it into position. Super simple. Well, not so simple. Since the PCB angle adapter for the PCI Express slot has been offset to slot into the PCI Express slot on the motherboard, there is a substantial gap between the PCI Express notch on the card and this daughter board. This is where the PCI Express extender comes into play. Although it can slot into the motherboard simply enough, it's a little tricky to then slot the graphics card into the extender. The daughter board isn't very robustly secured to the bracket, so there's quite a lot of flex. So the extended PCI Express slot is just adding leverage to the situation. Unfortunately, when I went for the other option of connecting the PCI Express extender to the graphics card first, curiosity got the better of me and I wanted to remove the PCI Express extender to take a closer look. And this is where the unfortunately part comes in. The footage was after it snapped the first time and I super glued it back together, hence why it was ideally captured. But instead of repairing it a second time, I took this as a red that the pins on the back weren't in good shape and I'd need a new one. So this is where things get a little interesting and speaks to the quality of Silverstone customer service, at least in this instance. I got in touch with Silverstone to explain the situation and added that I think the part failed due to the tight tolerances to the rear compared to the front which you can see here, which isn't ideal for a scenario that is more variable than a straight connection to a mainboard. 
If you want a more in-depth discussion about this part and its issues, you can check this video out. Back to the email, I asked if I could have a replacement part sent out and rather cheekily asked if I could have a spare sent to me as well in the event that this happens again. A long shot, but if you don't ask, you don't get. Silverstone responded a day later and apologised for the inconvenience, but also added that they haven't had any product failure with the RVZ03, so if I wanted any replacement PCI Express extenders, they would cost me €9.64 each plus shipping, which in my case is international, so that's at least £5. So we'd be looking at about €15 Euros for a replacement PCI Express extender. They added that I'd have to send them an address to receive a quotation and said that they'd add a picture of the part to avoid any confusion, which made me quite confused when the only image in or attached to the email was for a power supply unit. So of course I responded in as calm a manner as possible after a company was trying to charge me 15 euros on top of the 100 pounds I'd already spent on the case. I mentioned that I was surprised that no one else had had the issue and since the tolerances were so tight it could easily be repeatable which on a side note I've sort of already proven after supergluing it back together only to have it break again. I also theorised that not many people had likely dismantled their system from their case therefore avoiding the issue entirely at this time. Of course I mentioned that 10 euros was a little steep considering I'd already paid 100 pounds for the case to begin with and asked if this wasn't covered by any sort of warranty, which they could have brought up in the first place rather than jump on me to make more money. This really got on my nerves. At this point I just wanted the damn part to complete the review since this was going to set the channel back by at least a week for me to get another part into review, so I added that I'll pay the cost for the part and the shipping for the sake of completing the review. On reflection it's a shame that I mentioned that, but frankly I needed this part as soon as possible and any leverage I could get while remaining completely honest was going to be used. So they went quiet for a couple of days, so I sent them an email prompting them to respond to the previous correspondence. An hour later they responded saying they've spoken with their RMA department and they'll send the part out. I later responded thanking them for their gesture of goodwill and of course sent them some details to get the part sent over. Now some may be watching thinking what an arsehole he clearly abused his position to leverage a free part and I'd agree to a certain extent, however we've been able to uncover two sides of the coin here. If you were just a random customer asking for a replacement part they'd be more than happy to charge you for it and make more money on top of the money they've already made. But if you mention that you're reviewing the case, this coming from a tiny channel with seemingly zero leverage, they drop the charge and send it out for free. Frankly that is just abominable. No company should be treating their customers and reviewers differently at all when it comes to replacement parts and general support. I know this isn't true of all situations, but when it comes to a broken component, this is just unacceptable. And I hope they weren't sending it free of charge with the hope that I wouldn't bring this up and explain the entire situation. Here at AV Techie, we're a little more pro-consumer than that, and that behaviour isn't going to slide. Anyway, sorry guys, let's get back to the graphics card installation. So to not break anything, slot the PCI Express extender onto the graphics card evenly, bearing in mind that it's only when removing it that you need to be really careful. Then we can head back to the graphics card bracket and slot it into position like in any other case, although you'll need to press a little harder than usual and support the door to board keeping it in position, and then the screws can be replaced to secure the graphics card in place. Wait a minute, we need to back up. We forgot to add the graphics card support brackets. To do this, we need to grab those plastic brackets we saw earlier and place the one with the two plastic pins into the holes on the graphics card bracket. Notice how there are many holes so you can have this varying in position depending on your graphics card width and length. Now take it off, place your card back and then slot it back in place and secure it in position. You'll also want to make sure you've added one of the rubber pads to the base so that the bracket doesn't scratch your graphics card's finish. We can then add the rubber pad to the other bracket and secure it to the previous bracket, and of course replace all the screws in the outlet bracket of the graphics card. Now this is going to make some of you cringe a little, but to see how secure this all is I thought I'd shake the whole assembly a bit. Note that the plastic bracket does flex a little towards the back but it is plastic so what would you expect, but thinking past that it's actually holding up really well considering it's not being supported by the chassis with the six screws that hold it in place. Before we can replace the graphics card and all the drives back into the case, there are a few steps that need to be taken first. Now this panel being removed now is by far my favourite of this case and perhaps of any case I've worked with so far. As sad as that sounds on the surface, let's go over why. 
First of all, if you don't want it to be there, you can remove the panel entirely and gain two cable management loops which act as the panel's lateral support. The panel itself can hold a 2.5 inch drive, so that's your typical SATA SSD, up to 14mm which is a double thickness hard disk drive like the 4TB one we're installing here. And when you replace the panel, it has a cutout at the bottom that you can use for routing the front I.O. cables through. Now some of the forward thinking among you may be concerned about routing the graphics card cables through this hole as well, but I was able to add both 8 pin power cables through. It was a squeeze but there was a little room to spare afterwards. But if your cables are thicker than the ones I have that I'm using, there is also space above that has been accounted for by the graphics card bracket as well. It needs to be mentioned that the maximum recommended power supply unit size by Silverstone is a 150mm ATX power supply unit, but if you add a standard 2.5 inch drive here which is 7mm thick, they recommend a 140mm long power supply unit. And it should go without saying, but if you double the thickness of the 2.5 inch drive on that panel like we have here, you should be looking at a power supply unit that is 130mm or at a push 135mm long. So now the drive is in place and the power cables are all connected to the power supply unit, we can now replace the graphics card bracket. But before it can be fitted in place, the power cables need to be connected first. There's no way you'll be able to do this afterwards. Once they're all connected though, the bracket can be returned to its default position in the case. But we'll need to dig this back out later to add more fans for extra thermal testing. So once it's in place, the six original screws can now be replaced. Notice how two of the screws are going through the small 2.5 inch drive panel by the power supply unit, thus rounding off my arguments for it being the most useful panel of any case. It does drive support, cable management and to a certain extent graphics card support. So that's pretty much 90% of the components installed into the case, now we need to hook up all the power and data cables. But just before we clutter the place up, it's worth pointing out that there's around 35-40mm to 40 millimeters of space between the chassis side panel and the graphics card, this one being the EVGA GTX 1070 for the win. So that's plenty of room to add a standard fan with circulation room to spare. Anyway, back to the cable management. First up are those fiddly front I.O. wires and cables. These are always a nightmare to install after the main power cables have gone everywhere. Next up is the fan splitter for two of the included case fans. I actually forgot about the fan splitter included with the case, so I'm using my own. Like I mentioned earlier, it's actually a pretty nice one and doesn't seem to be the cheapest one off the shelf. It's worth pointing out that I did find it quite useful to route the lower fan cable and the audio cable around the back of the PCI Express daughter board. Then we have the SATA power for the top drives and the power for the motherboard. Up next is the CPU power connector and this is where I started to hit some cable issues. It's not the amount of cables that's causing an issue at the moment, but it's more the rigidity and the memorized curves of cables from a previous build that are pressing against the far RAM stick. So at least for now, I've strung a few velcro straps together to hold them in place tight against the power supply unit bracket. Actually, some cable management loops wouldn't go amiss here as standard, a thought for future revisions perhaps. You can never have enough cable management loops. Back to the other two drives, this is where this interesting drive position comes into play. There's a secret channel hidden above the graphics card that allows you to route the power and data cables through for this device. This isn't mentioned in the manual so it's worth mentioning here since it's a really nice touch. So that's the majority of the wires all dealt with, now we need to talk about the lighting setup situation. There's a fair amount to discuss here so please skip this section if you're not overly bothered about the lighting setup. So in terms of controlling and connecting your LEDs, providing them power, that sort of thing, uh, we have the LEDs of the chassis itself which have a female connector on them uh, and we'll cover that in a second. You can also add in some uh, Silverstone fan covers, LED fan covers, lots of other different fan covers around, not just from Silverstone. If they have universal fan uh, connections, RGB fan connections, so you have a 12 volt and then RGB uh, pins from there. If it's a universal standard, then it will be able to work with all the ways we're going to cover now. Um, and if you wanted to add in for some reason lighting, strips you want to I don't know mod some sort of window onto here then yes you will be covered by these sorts of things so there are two main ways of, of controlling and connecting these things there's a direct connection to the motherboard you can connect the motherboard to this box here and have more outlets um, although that might not be necessary in every case or you can control uh, the the LEDs through this box if you don't have a motherboard uh, RGB connector RG, RGB header on your motherboard uh, which is actually fantastic because I'm going to be using a Z170 uh, motherboard which doesn't 
doesn't have an RGB header. Um, I think it's Z270 series onwards of motherboards that generally have those features, but not all of them do. So just make sure yours does. If not though, you can always use this. So in terms of the motherboard, we do have a couple of cables here. This is a female to a universal female um, uh, cable or connector. And it also has a male connection on the end of that passing through from there. So the power goes and links all the way through. Uh, that's a really interesting uh, cable in itself because I mean, you can add in the other one, which is identical to that. So again, you're looking at grabbing the wrong ends of that there. Uh, you're looking at a straight pass through then, and then you have two universal connectors at the end, and then you have another uh, another female pass through, or male pass through actually, and then you have a final connector at the end here, which they provide, which is a male connector on one end, and or female connector on one end to the male that led, led off from the previous ones, and then it means you have three universal connectors. So you can use these however you fancy, uh, and connect them up to whatever um, sort of universal style um, controllers and, you know, RGB LED stuff that you have. Uh, if you think that, or if you have done the maths and the amperage of whatever you're connecting, it's going to max out your headers. I'm not sure if the amperage of, uh, of an RGB LED header is like one amp or something, but it's worth checking those out. You can always connect the motherboard to this box. To do that, you're going to want to connect the universal header on one end to your motherboard and then make sure that the uh, the arrow pin is on the 12 pin, 12 volt pin. Uh, and then you're going to want to connect this uh, connector to, I believe it to be the center slot on the end of this uh, of this sort of control unit. Uh, you also want to connect the flick the switch onto MB for motherboard control and not IC for I believe independent control. Um, but anyway, so we'll have it plugged into the end there as far as I believe. The instructions don't necessarily say to put it into that slot but I probably would because it seems to be the most sensible one. And if you need to provide extra power which is probably the likely reason you would do this, you can plug uh, this Molex connector. They call it a two pin to four pin connector, but really it's a Molex with two pins, which is tra traditionally or normally a four pin connector. And then you have a two pin connector on this side and that will connect into the end. Make sure you put it in the correct one. Otherwise you will end up bending the pins of the other two pin connector. We'll cover that in a second. So basically what you can do from there is connect any of these, um, any, of these any of these connectors here and any connector that will be compatible with these. I think these are proprietary. I don't think they're going to be uh, standard connectors or universal connectors. I haven't played around with this stuff a lot. If it turns out they are universal, I'll put there. If they're proprietary, I will put that there as well. Um, but yeah, so you can connect as many of those to any of these slots as you fancy. There's plenty around. It would, it would, I would feel that they would be universal connectors since there's so many available. I wouldn't have thought Silverstone would be so. I wouldn't have thought stingy to just close it off to all their components. But it, they've done a lot of universal coverage so far, so it would make little sense to go away from that. Uh, or at least, at least they could provide cables to uh, to connect uh, universal. Um, components to them. Um, so anyway, so that's basically the motherboard coverage. So that's basically everything you can do to cover the motherboard connections. So I shouldn't really pull them by the cables, but I do. So if you want to control this independently, all the lighting independently, what you can do is slot the switch over to IC for independent control. To give it power, you need to slot the Molex connector to the two pin into the power connector, which is on the right side if you have this facing straight up. And then what you're going to want to do to control this is take your reset switch uh, uh, pins from the front IO and put them into the other two pin slot on the side. Now, now that is probably a detail that lots of people are going to miss. Uh, in the manual, if I quickly flick over, uh, I'll quickly just give you a brief show of this from um, from here. You can't actually see. There, there you go. That's the RGB connector guide. It's just a wall of text there. So that wall of text is actually it's small. It's like small print size text. Um, probably a lot of people will miss this. Stick the uh, reset switch into here, doesn't matter which way you have it around because it's a switch connector. And then you can use the uh, reset switch button in order to change, turn off, if you hold it down you'll turn off the lights. And I believe there's some modes in here, I would have thought there would be some modes that you can flick through in terms of different colours and maybe you know different lighting effects uh, and that sort of thing. But there we go, so you can control it from that with your reset switch. Again, obviously your reset switch function will be gone because it won't be connected to your motherboard reset switch header. Pins. So anyway, that's pretty much that in terms of coverage of, of the different ways you can connect everything together. Uh, I hope that was useful and I hope that I did put the before. If you want to skip this, go to this time because otherwise that would have been a huge amount of time spent on something that might not be relevant to all people. 
As for installing the lighting unit into the case, I initially connected the front panel lighting into the front position on the box, but as annotated previously, the front center connection is an input only for the motherboard control. So you'll need to connect the front panel LED and any other LED devices through the lighting wires provided in the side and the end slots, which are all output headers, none of which are explained in the manual or labeled on the box itself. With the Molex power connector hooked up and the reset wires from the front I.O. connected to the other 2-pin slot for lighting control, it just needs to be fitted inside the case. So I opted to slot it into the gap between the SFX power supply unit and the power supply unit bracket, which is where the other 3 Molex connectors are hidden as well. I'm sure there are plenty of people looking at this cluster of cables and chalking it down to bad cable management on my part, but frankly it's amazing that the excess for all of these power connectors and the SATA data cables for all the drives as well as the double height 2.5 inch hard disk drive can all fit into this slot. However, we also need to consider that if you were to use an ATX power supply unit that's deeper than the 100mm SFX power supply unit we have here, you'd have nearly twice the amount of cables to deal with, which could start encroaching on the CPU cooling area, thus affecting performance somewhat. I'd strongly recommend adding an extra 20 to 50 pounds or your regional equivalent to your power supply unit budget for a build in this case to get yourself an SFX power supply unit that's powerful enough for your system. So now all that's left to do is to replace the side panel and see how the stock fan configuration holds up. So that's just a case of adding the side panel fan to the fan splitter installed earlier, remember that you get one with the case, and then we can lay the panel on top and secure it into position with the provided screws. Just before we move on, we need to add some feet to the case to help keep the system stable and in place. The vertical feet are these rubber clip-like components and they slot into these ventilation strips to the top and base of the case, so you can stand your system either way around. There are also the adhesively attached round feet included to support the case in a horizontal position. I'll be testing the system with Prime95 and Furmark in both orientations to see how it copes, and continue further testing with the best performing orientation. So in terms of the test system, what we've just created is the as it comes setup, which is essentially just throwing the test system in with the stock cooling setup of the two included intake case fans. Speaking of the test system, I've not mentioned that we're using the i7-6700K at 4GHz and 1.2V for our CPU, which is being cooled by the Noctua L9i with our custom painted A9X14 fan. And the graphics card we're using is the EVGA GTX 1070 for the win that boosts up to 2GHz and generally doesn't fall far short of that unless the thermals hit the roof. So I tested that setup to see how it performed with the stock fans, but we're just going to quickly go over the second variation of the cooling system before we get into the test results. What you're seeing here is the changeover to the max fan setup, where the stock fans are replaced and where possible, we're placing as many 2200 RPM fans as the case can support. In this case, that's a total of three 2200 RPM fans. This whole process of dismantling the system as minimally as possible to get the two fans behind the graphics card and changing the one on the panel took a total of 50 minutes, which also included setting up the different recording angles and lighting, so let's say it took around 30 to 40 minutes instead. That of course sounds like an obscene amount of time, but the main holdups were replacing the graphics card so it didn't clash with any cables and sat in the required position, and replacing the side panel after changing the side panel fan. There was quite a squeeze going on between the fan's frame and the motherboard and CPU power cables against the power supply unit bracket. You'll notice here that the two screws securing the panel in position were preventing the panel from being pushed out of position by those power cables. Something I found interesting with the Max Fan's test setup was that the 2500 RPM fan of the CPU cooler, which generally runs at about 2600 RPM, is actually running at 2800 RPM, with the 2200 RPM fan case fan assisting it. But it's also interesting to know that the speed of the fan above the CPU cooler is running at about 1900 RPM, where it's rated for and has run at before 2200 RPM. There would appear to be some noticeable back pressure due to the confined space behind the fan. So let's go over the Prime95 and Furmark thermals of the vertical mounting position as opposed to the horizontal mounting position. Starting off with the stock fan setup, there's a significant increase in thermals of the CPU and the GPU from the horizontal setup. You can find a key of the bar colors up top and all the case components were running at full speed, all the fans that is, to eliminate the fan curve variables. It's also good to know that the temperature figures you're reading are delta T figures, meaning that ambient temperature of the room is subtracted from the temperature of the components to normalize the results and make them more easily comparable. 
However, there's more to the story. The CPU thermal throttled in the horizontal position signified by the bar fading to red, even though the CPU was facing up and wasn't restricted by a tight zone between the desk like the GPU was. We'll check out the clock speed results in a second, but let's take a look at the difference the faster fans made first. Adding the faster 2200 RPM fans brought the CPU temperatures right down to around 65 degrees delta T in both orientations, and although nearly 20 degrees was knocked off the temperature of the GPU in the horizontal orientation, it's still around 5 degrees hotter with two fans in the horizontal orientation than the single stock fan in the vertical orientation. So just to round off the horizontal versus vertical tests off, let's check out the clock speed results. The stock fan saw the CPU drop down to 3.6GHz compared to the 4GHz stock clock, but despite over 20 degrees difference in GPU temperature, there was only a 10MHz drop in the GPU speeds, which strikes me as a little suspicious. I kept my eye on the GPU utilization during these tests and it showed 98% and above for the full 10 minutes. Of course this speaks to the less extreme downclocking curve of the GPU, but it's still a little strange. Strange. As for the upgraded fans, the CPU thermal throttling was completely eliminated from the horizontal testing and it was never there in the vertical testing, and there were some slight gains in GPU clock speed over the stock fans with both orientations. But since the vertical results bested the horizontal results, we'll continue testing with the vertical orientation. Moving on to the full comparison chart, we'll start with Prime95 and Combustor, and then move on to some graphics and gaming benchmarks. Notice the purple bar increases from left to right. That signifies the case's size in litres, which can help to identify cases that perform particularly well or poorly based on their size. And the test bench results are all the way to the left as a best case scenario. Based on this graph showing the 10 minute Prime95 and combustor test with the stock fan, it would appear that the RVZ03 is a really compelling option for a performance system, especially if you go for a much larger top down style cooler like the L9X65. Adding the faster fans brought the GPU temperature within 0.5 degrees of the test bench setup, which when taking test tolerance into account basically makes them dead even. But something that's even more impressive is that the CPU isn't thermal throttling either in the stock or max fans setup. In terms of clock speed, the stock fan setup just wipes the floor with all other cases in their stock cooling setups, and adding faster fans sees overall improvements to the RVZ03's performance where many other cases saw turbulence and temperature trades between the CPU and GPU. As for the suite of Firestrike results, the RVZ03 is king of the hill again, and that isn't all that surprising since there are case fans directly feeding cool air solely to the CPU and the graphics card where most other cases like the CR280 and the Q300L have case fans far from the action. And of course adding fans maintains the lead for the RVZ03, but we did see a slight 0.6 degree increase in CPU temperature, but you could account that for testering tolerance, and this is a graphics based benchmark with limited CPU utilization to begin with. Graphics Test 2 gives us more of the same action, the RVZ03 is just nailing it, but again, adding more fans sees the CPU temperature increase by 2 degrees in this test, which starts to bring it out of the range of tolerance. However, the CPU doesn't get utilised a lot in this test, again, and temps are very low, so even background tasks could see this sort of bump. We'll have to keep an eye on this metric in upcoming tests. As for the physics test, this one being a much more CPU intensive test, the SOC fan test results shows the RVZ03's direct cooling is pushing it nicely ahead of the competition, and the max fan test results shows the RVZ03 and the satellite are neck and neck. Interesting how the smallest cases are beating the larger cases, that Q300L seems to be struggling more on the end than Cooler Master's marketing team would have you believe. And lastly for Firestrike, the combined test gives another victory to the RVZ03 in both As It Comes and Max Fans tests. So I think that's enough synthetic benchmarking, let's round all this off with a few gaming benchmarks. Rise of the Tomb Raider shows the RVZ03 keeping the lead, and a fairly substantial lead at that for the GPU temps in particular, and this lead is maintained when changing over to the max fan setup. I just want to point out that I didn't copy and paste the CPU result over to the GPU result, and VSync was definitely off. This just happens to be a Rise of the Tomb Raider 60fps system. As for Hitman, we've got some rather strange results. The As It Comes test seems to be in order with the RVZ03 coming out ahead of the others as in the previous tests, but adding in faster fans saw the GPU temps increase by nearly 6 degrees. It looks like a failed test, but out of the two runs of both setups, the results stand as they are here. 
And finally, GTA 5 provides some potentially more reliable results, which saw the CR280 just ahead on CPU temps, and the RVZ03 takes the lead on GPU temps. And after adding faster fans in, the CR280 maintains the lead for CPU temps, but the RVZ03 takes the lead over the test bench for GPU temps. That might sound really strange, but it's not unrealistic since the test bench didn't have two 2000 RPM fans forcing cool air into the graphics card heatsink. So there we have it, the build complete thermal testing done. And now we're going to wrap up the whole video with a pros, cons, and missed opportunities segment. I found it quite useful in the last couple of reviews to do something like this because, I mean, it gives everyone a good sort of uh, roundup summary of, of what we've just experienced. Now, one thing I want to point out just before we go through that is that I think I've done this for about two reviews prior to this. Uh, that was the pros, cons. Ah, oh, you can barely see. That's the pros, cons and missed opportunity segments for the Q300L. Uh, there were much more missed opportunities there. In terms of the Colink satellite, uh, it was about even all round, but uh, less uh, pros than there were missed opportunities and cons respective to each. But in the RVZ03, there are plenty more pros than there are cons and missed opportunities. So I just want to point that out of a, of a start. Uh, I think this case is probably one of the best that I have actually uh, been able to work with within its form factor style, not necessarily so going up to micro ATX cases, the uh, defined mini C temper glass, things like that, those are, are, um, are far easier cases to work with, but in terms of its style and what it can do with it, what it's got, it's doing pretty well. So we'll start off with pros. So pros, the style, the front panel is very nice. Uh, I really do like the lighting. I love the style of this sort of, I think I called it a, uh, a saw tip style protrusion at the front on both sides. That looks pretty cool, some arrows or something wrapping all the way around. In the, uh, in the cons, I think, or missed opportunity, I think you could say that uh, the, the side panels could do with something a little bit, not necessarily more thematic, maybe more minimalist than what they've put in, because they seem to have random place shapes and things. Anyway, build quality is pretty spot on, to be fair. Uh, nothing I found was loose, flimsy, uh, or rattled around or anything like that, so very solid. Uh, the GPU bracket, I just think is a really interesting, uh, innovative, that word gets bandied around quite a lot, but it's quite an innovative way of being able to store the graphics card in the vertical orientation and uh, maximize the use of that uh, that panel by putting hard disk drives or um, two and a half two and a half inch drives all over the place uh, the accessories box that was jam-packed of all sorts of stuff you could use that was you know fantastic uh, that moves on then to the uh, user manual then I'm gonna say was pretty spot-on in most cases I'd say it's it's a pro definitely good descriptions on the whole uh, but there were some illustrations missing we'll um, we'll get onto that though illustrations and good descriptions mainly there though uh, two and a half inch drive mounts 
four of them. That's fantastic. I'm not surprised. You might be able to hear a bird in the background. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm not surprised there aren't any three and a half inch drive brackets or mounts or anything like that in here because they're just very cumbersome and large things that need that bird needs to be quiet. Anyway, the large cumbersome pieces, so it's hard to fit them into very crammed tight cases such as this. So two and a half inch drives, not a problem by me. Cable management space. It's nice to see that there was a space designed for cable management. I didn't show it actually in the um, in the user manual, but they actually uh, denote the area that's by the power supply unit for cable management. That's very that's very good, especially being so tight in there. Uh, lighting control box and accessories. Uh, again, all accessories for the lighting control box and, and, and its usability, its function. Having that there to be able to uh, add in more lighting components, perhaps. It's, it's difficult with this case because you can't really see a lot of lighting components that can be added here, but I can imagine they use that box on many more cases than just that one, and I don't think I'd be wrong in saying something like that, so a nice function to use with other cases as well. Vertical feet, fantastic. I like the mechanical fixing of the vertical feet. I don't particularly like the, the Silverstone logos on the feet themselves. You may have spotted that earlier. Don't look very classy, I don't think. They sort of detract a little bit from the overall style, but they haven't got their logo anywhere else, so I suppose that's not too bad. They could have built their logo into the fan, um, into the fan covers and things like that, or the fan vent areas. That would have been quite interesting as well. It's quite a, a nice logo in itself, so that would have been interesting. And then the stock and max cooling round off the pros is just it unbeatable in my testing so far so very solid i don't think you can really push this case to be more impressive in terms of its cooling capability uh, unless you add more fan placements everywhere but realistically there's just no room for it uh, you perhaps could upgrade some to 140 millimeter ones but frankly that would probably detract from uh, the the style of the case because most people are probably going to be using 120s um, and a 140 millimeter fan is just going to look it's just going to be a bit too large i think in this case but anyway if you had 120s on a 140 millimeter cover you have that band around the edge which just looks a bit like like a missed opportunity of your own case anyway going on to cons uh, mismatch vents. Uh, I like the vent styles. Generally, pretty okay. They could have done something a little bit more. Uh, I could, they could put the logo there. They could have uh, perhaps done a bit more with the vents as they were to perhaps match a, an overall theme going on. That would have been nice. Uh, but it doesn't match the power supply unit one, which I can see right here. You saw earlier. It doesn't match the power supply unit vent cover, and that's just a bit of a disappointment. So I would have liked to see something more done with that. Um, so user manual. Missing illustrations here and there. I would have liked to see more spelling mistakes as well. There's just a lot of little ones, and I know that Silverstone, as far as I'm aware, well, as far as I'm concerned, I did speak to their, their I know, headquarters or something. It was in Germany. Uh, they're a German company, as far as I'm aware. Um, ironically, not British because of Silverstone Racetrack. Anyway, um, but yes, the, I mean, in this day and age, that you can just you can literally speak to a translator, go over it. It'll only take them an hour to have a good read through and work out what needs changing, things like that. And that wouldn't wouldn't have cost them a lot in the in the runnings, uh, considering they're selling this thousands and thousands of times, I assume. Um, so anyway, uh, PCI Express extender bracket design. Don't like that design. They need to work on that. It's the bracket design itself works for uh, complete um, vertical or horizontal, as it were, just complete straight slot in slot out situations. I explained in my longer video on that, but it doesn't work so well when when you can rotate it around slotting it in and pulling it out so it doesn't work so well like that so for this use case I think they need to find a slightly different design for future cases like that or this just to make sure that you know they're not having any of those failure rates coming back when people start dismantling their system which will probably be outside of the warranty which probably won't worry them too much but I think if they wanted to be consumer pro or pro consumer then perhaps they could look into some other ideas at least or maybe explain in a future um, in a future iteration why they couldn't do something better than that but again this might just be a problem I'm having so I could be completely you know going over the heads of everyone else because what I'm saying is just to one person myself um, customer support didn't like the customer support, how they tried to charge me uh, 10 euros essentially for, for them to send that part out, even though somebody hasn't contacted them yet saying, oh yeah, this broke, can you send a new one out? Doesn't necessarily give you the right to start the uh, proceedings with, because nobody's done that, we're going to charge you. So it always has to start with one person, so what, you're going to charge the first person, the first hundred people, and then when they realise, perhaps, if in the future if it happened, that more people were complaining about a certain component in any of their cases, they'd start not charging them? Uh, I don't understand that entirely. Um, and yeah, so customer support, not too happy with. And yeah, if you do have problems yourself, just say you're reviewing the case. I shouldn't say this, but just say you're reviewing the case and they'll probably send it out to you for free. Um, but 
probably preface like like I did that you had problems and see if what they do first. Um, but you could say you're reviewing the case and make a really just make a really quick review. Uh, yeah, great case. This bracket broke. Whatever. You know, it could be ten seconds. You still technically reviewed the case. Uh, but anyway, I shouldn't say that. But you know. Yeah. Anyway, so door to board support as well. There was only two points, so it was doing the sort of uh, it was providing some lateral support as it were. Uh, but there wasn't. There was quite a lot of flex other way other way round. So they could have a third support higher up to stop that flex from countering out from just the standard you know two L points that there were. You probably saw that in the video yourself. Uh, so missed opportunity. Cable management loops on the power supply unit bracket would have been nice to have. It's not a necessity, but it's a missed opportunity. It could have been there, and frankly, because there's no. Uh, uh, windows with this case if you mod then you know right on I'm pretty sure you can make some really impressive windows on this case uh, especially by the graphics card area and the uh, the drive mounting area which is around the back there a couple of uh, tempered glass panels in there if you can fit them if you can spot on well done uh, but yeah because there aren't any as standard then a couple of cable management loops on the side of the power supply unit bracket probably would have helped quite a lot uh, hence why I had to strap it in to begin with because you know you have certain like uh, um, cable memory as it were I think it's called but it just re re retains the form of previous forms uh, for quite a while until it relaxes into its uh, into its position there could have been 80 millimeter fan placements as standard perhaps maybe one at the top a couple at the bottom perhaps um, but that and um, you know again with the power supply unit bracket not necessary at all even more so for the 80 millimeter fan support because I'm not entirely sure myself if it's viable but there's potential for that to go into it potentially um, horizontal feet the ones which you know you stick onto the sides I think that sounds like a bit of an afterthought it's like well where do we put them oh um, let's just, just give them some uh, sticky back um, tape on them and they can stick them wherever they like. There aren't any pre-designated areas for them, they don't really explain much about them, uh, so I think it was a bit of a tagged on thing at the end. That's a bit of a shame, I would have liked to see something perhaps utilising these these mechanical fixings around the, the ventilation shrouds at the top and the base would have been more interesting to see if they could come off those and um, to sort of part off those and see if they can make something better. And then I think finally we have, that's it actually, no, that's just a slight point saying no adhesive or not adhesive ones for those feet. So that's pretty much it. There are far more uh, pros than their respective cons and uh, missed opportunities, not combined of course. Uh, but if you say pros to cons, I think you've got twice as many pros as there are cons. So as far as I'm concerned, that's good um I know people are going to have their own opinions about these things, but again, that's people's opinions and that's completely fine. Uh, I don't think I'm wrong in saying any of the things I've said, but but put it this way, every case, nearly every professional product that, you know, hasn't been designed for 10 years plus or something is going to have some sort of issue with it, uh, unless it's really scrupulously tested. You know, And I don't think cases generally have that opportunity and time to do so. And that's respectable because you can't, you know, wait around for years and years to do uh, to, you know, get one of these out. Obviously, years and years, some take a couple of years to do. Uh, but frankly, I mean, to be honest, I, I work in the architecture industry. So if you can get a building design um, completely designed, all the mechanical m and &E and the structures and everyone coordinated together within two years and get a building sorted, I think you can sort of do the same with the case. Uh, but again, buildings have all sorts of problems themselves. Anyway, that's getting off point. Um, so there are inherently going to be issues with every case. And it's just pointing them out. And if you can deal with them, that's spot on. And that's what I'm trying to get across to you. So anyway, thanks for checking out this video. If you want to support the video uh, or the channel in a sense in, in any way, then you can, of course, uh, subscribe to the channel, which doesn't actually help the video. Uh, you can like and dislike and comment on anything you liked or didn't like. That would be absolutely fantastic. You can subscribe to support the channel and at least I can see uh, how the channel grows in that kind of sense and know if I've got sort of regular people coming back, although that kind of doesn't work in that sense, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Anyway, if you want to support the channel even further than that, you can, of course, go over to Patreon and throw in a dollar a month or something. Just to support the channel, we can get more interesting things in and uh, record things in more interesting ways and things like that with the more support we get. I have actually been able to purchase a Dremel um, for some DIY projects, some um, custom case things, some case mods, things like that we're going to try in the future uh, based on Patreon money, so that's absolutely fantastic. Thank you all Patreons for that support, uh, or patrons of Patreon for that support, and I've gone on way too long now, so thank you very much for checking this one out. I'll catch you in the next one, which I don't actually know which it is, but I'll probably be starting something tomorrow. And uh, yes, actually on that point, tomorrow I am going to be, all things going well, live streaming the unbuilding of, or the unbuild of this case, of this system, if you're interested in seeing that at all. Thanks for checking this one out. Catch you then. Bye-bye.